This episode is sponsored by Fire and Fuel Coaching, where I help you discover who you are and where you want to go, both on and off the job. For more information, please reach out to me at my Instagram handle at Jerry Fire and Fuel. Welcome to today's episode of Enduring the Badge Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Dean Lund. And if you haven't already done so, please take out your phone and hit that subscribe button. I don't want you to miss an upcoming episode. And hey, while your phone's out, please give us a rating and review on whichever platform you listen to this podcast on, such as iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. It helps this podcast grow. And the reason why, when this gets positive ratings and reviews, those platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify show this to other people that never listened to this podcast before. And that allows our podcast to grow and make a more of an impact in other people's lives. So if you would do that, I would appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. So my very special guest today is Matt Spade. We'll just go by spade because it's really cool. I like that. One. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think so. <laughs> yeah. so. Spade, what? Tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Oh uh, well, I'm a Marine Corps veteran. Uh, I joined just out of high school. Um, also married with two kids. Got married while I was in the Marine Corps, very young. Uh, still married, going on 16 years. Uh, we got a nine-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter. Um, I'm a strength coach. I've been in the fitness industry basically since about 2012 and i got in the fire service in 2013 um, and i've always done a little bit of both um, and now currently i'm a full-time firefighter uh the rank of captain at my department and i do personal training out of my garage gym now yeah it's quite when you see his instagram page it's quite the garage gym i was checking it out yeah it's 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 pretty nice pretty nice so you joined the marine corps really early um yeah uh it was pretty much it was was honestly kind of eerie when i first looked up information for the marine corps i did it i was working two jobs at the time my senior year of high school looked up online and the next day at my other job a recruiter showed up and just he just happened to be I, I was working at an Orange Julius in the mall mm-hmm. and he just happened to be walking by. But I kind of felt like they were watching me or something. <laughs> but yeah, I joined the day after I turned 18. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, right out of high school, pretty much back in uh, 2006. Yeah, that was uh, quite a change. And then uh, you got married and had some kids during that time. Yeah, uh, well. We waited a little while to have kids, but yeah, I got married um, in 2007, uh, so I've been in the Marines for about a year, um, and that's when I got married. Uh, my wife uh, is one of the few. She was like extremely uh, dedicated to me with all the deployments and everything I went through after the deployments as well, um, and you know, it's something that, uh, you know, uh, are, are you married? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, then like marriage, you know, it, it takes a lot of work. So, right. you know, we've had our ups and downs, but we've, we've both grown together. You know, I think that's a big part of marriage where, you know, you're, you're not going to be the same person uh, when you first married and it's helping each other. And I think we've both done a good job of that. Um, but yeah, we waited until uh, 2014 um, until having kids. So seven years. Yeah. Before get, then had my son. Yeah, I mean, getting, you know, the getting married young and then, you know, I'm glad you waited to have kids because that probably that whole throws a whole nother. Yeah, it's a whole other challenge, track. right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the things but you you do grow and you do change. You're not the same person, you know, when you started the Marines is when you ended, you know, being in the Marine. Right. I mean, what what transpired between there? A lot of growth, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, when I was in the Marines, for one thing, you know, I was infantry. Um, I served with 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines, Lima Company. Uh, did one deployment to Iraq and one deployment to Afghanistan. Uh, two very different deployments, too. Um, Iraq, it was uh, 2008. So the war was kind of winding down in Iraq then. It was a lot more of a hearts and minds sort of thing. Um you know, we, we did uh, some cool missions still. I was all around Al Anbar province. Uh, the the highlight of that deployment was we got to do some boat ops on the Euphrates. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we did some stuff in Zodiacs, looking all sneaky squirrel and 
uh, found some weapons caches on some islands and stuff. It was, uh, you know, pretty cool. Not everyone gets to do that sort of thing, especially in Iraq. Um, and I always right. think it's pretty cool, uh, that it's, you know, one of the rivers of Babylon. So, right. you know, how many people can say that they've been in that. So, um, that was a cool experience. Uh, came back from that deployment and, um, I wasn't too different. You know, obviously I changed a little bit. There was, you know, some more experience that way. I'd gotten a deployment under my belt. Um, you know, now it's kind of the time for me to step up and be in more of a leadership role. Um, I, so then I became a team leader, um, and the workup for Afghanistan, that was when, when I went to Afghanistan, it was a much different deployment. That was, uh, literally the start of the surge in, uh, 2009 2010 that president obama called for and uh i was a team leader made squad leader when my squad leader was incapacitated early on in the deployment and so i took over the squad and i was in uh helmand province which a lot of people if you're familiar with the war in afghanistan they're more familiar with helmand uh specifically now zad uh, and at the time, it was the hottest area of operations, um, lots of IEDs. That that was our biggest threat was IEDs. Um, and yeah, the training up to that was just, I, mean, I always tell people, I mean, yeah, I was back for, I don't know, maybe 10 months or maybe a little bit longer between deployments, but I was gone training almost that entire time. You know, we did a big workup for it. And, you know, I, I'm grateful for it because I'm a big believer in the saying of sweat more in training, bleed less in war. Um, yeah. We did have some casualties on that deployment, but um, we did really well overall. Um, just my squad alone uh, found probably over 20 IEDs. Um, and that's not necessarily me trying to say like our squad was so great. It's just that there were that many of them. And thankfully, though, again, with our training, we found them instead yeah. of stepping on them. Right. Um, but yeah, so, you know, and I won't go too much into like my deployments because, you know, I'd like to kind of get more into the first responder side of things. And again, like yeah. we were saying earlier, talk more about solution than just what happened to me. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. And just want to give the audience kind of a little bit of a backstory. Um about you and where you where you've been and you know some of the things you've you've gone through so let, let's dive into your story a little bit and you know start where you you feel like you should begin okay um so yeah i kind of already gave a little bit of a background uh with the marine corps but um grew up a uh, fairly normal family you know everyone has their problems growing up and stuff i won't go too much into that um had had loving parents um did a lot of various sports growing up, um, had one older brother and, uh, again, joined the Marine Corps, uh, right out of high school. Uh, I was very excited to go. I wanted to help fight in the war, um, and serve my country. And I just saw it as a good way to better myself as well. Um, so joined the Marine Corps and, um, about a year in, that was when I got married, um, and still married. And, uh, did the two deployments, one to Iraq, one to Afghanistan. And it was really kind of like what I was saying. The Afghan deployment was where I came back very different. And uh, my wife recognized early on too. And especially because she had been married and been with me early on in the Marines, she also saw the change in all of the guys I was in with as well. We all came back a little different. Um, took us a little while to recognize that, especially at first. Um, and I think um, honestly, almost longer for some other guys, I had been in recovery before joining the Marine Corps, um, which I'm now really grateful for. You know, at, at the time, you know, I was going through a hard time in high school, uh, battling some uh, alcoholism and addiction problems. Um, and but with that, you know, I, I dove into recovery and I was uh, clean and sober for about two years before joining. Um, and then when I joined the Marine Corps, I started drinking again. You know, the Marine Corps is kind of known for it. Um, but by that time, I had also gotten older. And I had realized, you know, there were, I had a lot of issues. But the thing is with 
addiction and alcoholism is, you know, that's your solution when you have these problems. Mm -hmm. Um, So I got to the root core of my problems and I was able to get a lot better. I was able to get more control over my drinking. There's a saying in Alcoholics Anonymous that there are those of us that are able to turn their drinking around and our hats are off to them. And I, I ended up being one of those guys. I can, my drinking is completely different now. Um, I was able to turn around. Now, I definitely had some times in the Marine Corps where I wasn't drinking like a gentleman, but but it wasn't the same thing still. I wasn't trying yeah. to fill in this hole, and um, it wasn't to the point where it was like, I'm just drinking in order to block out this pain. Right. Um, but anyway, so a little bit of background with that. I wanted to uh, add that in there because that's really a big part of why when I did get out of the Marines, so I, I got back from Afghanistan and about a month later, I was out of the Marine Corps. I didn't have a whole lot of transition time. Uh, I was going through squad leaders course uh, right before uh, our pre-deployment workups. And so I kind of got missed in the paperwork because they are supposed to have you uh, extend about 90 days uh, before getting out, if that is when your uh, EAS or end of active service is um and that just kind of got missed with me because i was going through that school so basically i was in afghanistan came back home on post-deployment leave and then was checking out of the marine corps and so it was kind of like you know combat and then all of a sudden civilian which is like a huge huge change um and still not recognizing some of the what was going on in my head um so, you know, I got out um, and kind of struggled a bit at first. I ended up uh, roughnecking in the oil field as my first job, um, which was actually a really good transitional job. Um, I, I was always busy, always had something in my hands. I was outside, able to take out some aggression with a sledgehammer, you know, like uh, it was. a. But again, th- so there was no doubt that I was dealing with PTSD then. Um I had come back very different. I was having recurring nightmares. Uh, I would have sleep paralysis where I just couldn't move, couldn't talk. Um, a lot of times my nightmares always, there was always this kind of same dark shadowy figure that when it would show up, I just couldn't move. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would wake up screaming or punching, you know. Um, and it was happening about like two to three times a week sort of thing. Um and then I was just, you know, constantly on edge, the the hypervigilance. Um, I was constantly trying to assess for some sort of a threat that might come in and just I couldn't I just couldn't shut down. Yeah. You know, that down regulating just wasn't right. happening. Um and I'd be constantly thinking about setting up positions and whatnot. But um again, thankfully I was able to kind of recognize that. Uh my wife was able to recognize it, and so I went and sought help at the VA. Um, Unfortunately, when I first went to them for help, they were really more interested in telling me about like the different sort of benefits I could get and disability stuff. And I was like, look, that's great and all, but I, you know, I need some help right now. You know, I I wanted help with my marriage, help with functioning again. And I just wasn't really getting that. You know, I I think the VA has gotten better, but at the time, when I was there, this would have been like 2010, 2011. It, it, it was still having some problems, um, at least where I was. So um, I, I ended up seeking some private counseling uh, after the VA didn't seem like it was really doing anything. And that was when we did some uh, cognitive behavioral training with my counselor then. Um, and it was really helpful. Um and a lot of other stuff, but, it, you know, and I, I, I stopped drinking for a while again because I was like, you know what, this is just making this a whole lot worse right now. So put the drinking on hold. And it was originally the counselor I, I saw was for like alcohol and uh, drugs, usually in youth. It was someone I saw when I was in high school. And now we had kind of switched gears, though, to where it was like, OK, because we had kind of a group of us that had been there when we were younger now we were all like early 20s adults um and still had a good group and for me they were like well you know 
keep coming here once I, I started drinking again and they were like you can just come here for your ptsd stuff because it, it was like yeah i i put it on hold but it, they were uh there was no doubt that i had the ptsd problems so that was more of what the focus was this time yeah. so um but yeah she was able to help me figure out more of uh we did like the tapping are you, are you familiar with tapping mm -hmm. yeah so yeah she did that and it was still pretty new then um and you know it, it was helpful it was kind of weird where it would she would go from you know whatever particular thing was bothering me at that moment to tap back and then it would bring me back into afghanistan and then from afghanistan to iraq iraq to you know and it was just kept bouncing back um until going all the way back to like my childhood yeah which was uh i was molested around the age of like six or seven and you know i i want to bring that up too because the more i've read about ptsd um, especially in veterans there is some sort of childhood trauma in a lot of them it's not like that's a requirement but it definitely seems like there's some sort of a connection there so yeah there's there's definitely uh science out there backing it up and it's pretty high don't quote me on this i think a number i heard was around 70 percent yeah had some kind of childhood trauma that that sounds right to me and, and yeah because i i and when i was at camp hope too i mean the amount of guys that mentioned some sort of childhood drama like it's just it's insane so that you know it makes it to where like if you have something like that and i think that's what led to my like early alcohol problems in high school and i didn't realize it then but that's why i got to the root of the problem and kind of solved it but then when i got out okay well now i have this post traumatic stress problem um and it was difficult to figure out at first things did get better um so uh, when i was seeing my counselor and stuff you know th there's all these different tools you can do to try getting better and honestly for me i got to do a lot of them you know i can't and i think that's probably everyone that has <laughs> yeah. this kind of stuff you know you can't just do one like, i can't go to counseling and poof get better because just like you know I, i'm a strength coach you can't just go to the gym you know yeah. one hour and then get better it's really all those other 23 hours in the day that make the difference yeah so same thing um and i eventually so i, I left roughnecking and then i began contracting for a brief time period um with the defense department like a uh, triple canopy was the name of the company uh did the training with them and i was waiting to uh, my plan was to do a year contract in iraq and i still wanted to be a firefighter then but i bought a house roughnecking had a mortgage and everything so i was like mm -hmm. okay well i'll do this year contract in iraq make a good amount of money and then i'll use my gi bill um but unfortunately this was right around the time when the army had pulled out of iraq so they weren't giving out work visas so basically i did this training with uh triple canopy and then was waiting to deploy uh so the guys that were in the states were stuck there and the guys in iraq were mm. stuck in iraq and and to me it was kind of funny because I, I just remember seeing on the news where everyone was all celebrating that you know we we're out of iraq and i was just kind of laughing because it's like what they're really doing is just hiring more contractors and got the military out of there but yeah switching it up yeah, we were still over there, but just in a different way. But uh, anyways, so I, I was kept on retainer. And that's when I after I'd been there for like a few months, that was when I started going to a gym. Um, it was a CrossFit gym and I uh, started using my GI Bill. Then I was like, oh, I might as well like do a class or two while I'm sitting here waiting. And uh, going to that gym was extremely helpful because at the time that was when, you know, I had stopped going to any place that was kind of crowded or, you know, loud noises, things like that. And, you know, a CrossFit gym is crowded with loud noises <laughs> and all that. So, but it, it forced me to get, you know, out of my comfort zone, interact with new people. And, you know, and then of course, with the strength training, I was doing some stuff that I'd never really done before. And um, now I know more about how strength training affects mental health. I'd always been into fitness, but I hadn't really dove into strength training that much. Yeah. Um, 
so that was kind of the start of that. And I started to feel better with that and realized that that was almost becoming a form of meditation for me. Um, because, you know, when you're squatting with a bunch of weight on your back, you're not really thinking about whatever else is going on in the world. You're thinking about that present moment, you know? Yeah. So that very much became like my therapy. Um, and so this kind of time period where I was contracting and waiting to deploy and it up uh, at the time I was really frustrated, but it, now I look back and it was really a mixed blessing where I could really find myself, you know, I, I found the gym, found some, uh, a good community. And, um, I'd always been a spiritual person, mm -hmm. uh, but I had never really found a religion that seemed to connect with me. I was, I was raised Catholic, but just, it just wasn't for me. Um, I knew there was some sort of a higher power out there, um, but I just wasn't sure what. And there actually ended up being a Buddhist temple in my neighborhood. Um, and I did some sort of like online survey and it said like Buddhism was kind of like the religion for me. Um, so it was just kind of strange that it ended up being in not the middle of my neighborhood, but right <laughs> down the road from me. And um it wasn't at all what I think most people think of when it's like a Buddhist temple. Um, sure. Very modern. And, you know, everyone like when I uh, had told my dad about it, he asked me if I was going to shave my head and wear robes and stuff. And I was like, well, that would be becoming a monk. But um, but anyways, I, I immediately uh, felt comfortable there. I'd always meditated. Um, and so it just kind of made sense uh, for me to pursue Buddhism as my religion. So, you know, I, I was able to dive more into that, find a religion, find a community aspect, um, and get a lot of help, you know, so I had my counseling again, I was going to, I had the gym, um, and then I had my religion and things were going really well. Um, and eventually now it had been like, I don't know how long, maybe it was like seven months. And they finally had called me up like, hey, you know, if you're ready, you can deploy. And I was like, well, now I'm, you know, got all this going on. And I was like, I'm good. And so I just took more classes. I dove into uh, the GI Bill, uh, pursued my associate's degree for fire municipality. I was like, you know, I'm just going to try my best to get hired on somewhere. Um, and then I started coaching as well, because more of the time in the gym, I started realizing how much I loved like helping people. Yeah. Um, cause you know, anybody in there, you kind of, you get training partners and kind of blend in and someone had suggested to me to be a coach. So I went and got my little, uh, CrossFit L1 and started coaching. And that was definitely the start, uh, to, I mean, I already had a love of fitness, but then a love of coaching, um, and helping people in, you know, so many aspects, whether it's just, through fitness, but you know, a lot of times people come in and they're not even talking about their fitness problems. They're talking about other problems. So you, a lot of times, you know, you kind of end up becoming almost more of a therapist sometimes with it, you know, but, but I liked it and, and just uh, helping people in so many di different ways too. Um, it was something that I enjoyed um, and I had a, a lot of uh, knowledge on it. And so I was coaching and uh, going to school, eventually got my degree and all my certifications uh, ended up getting hired uh, by a, a pretty small fire department. They were a combination. Um, I was one of the full-time guys um, and I loved it. I uh, loved the city. It, was, it needed um, a lot of growth and help at this department. So I figured I was kind of like maybe the guy that could do it um, with my Marine background. Um, and then I was coaching as well. So I had kind of weird hours though that, not a lot of people realized I wasn't doing regular like 24 on 48 off stuff. It was admin hours. So I was mm -hmm. working Monday through Friday, seven to four or five. Um, I think it was seven to four because then I was coaching in the evenings and sometimes in the mornings too. So my day was starting around like 5 a.m. coaching and then firefighter all day and then coaching in the evening, get home at like eight eight thirty and do it all over again usually yeah so and i was like this department the starting pay was absolutely horrific like the starting pay was like 950 an hour and um that was some I, I hear some people 
sometimes talk about how well firefighters are paid now. And there, there's definitely some places, but anytime someone yeah. brings that up, I always want to tell them what my starting pay was there. And, uh, and that ended up being a big uh, struggle too, just because, I mean, I was poor and like had to have all these second jobs, like a lot of firefighters and EMS right. people do. You know, like that's more of where you really get your money is your side gig, um, at least for some people. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, but with that work schedule and, you know, trying to improve the time, I was doing so many things that I was really burning myself out very early on. And some of it was just, you know, I was new to, I thought it was just how it was, um, like I was uh, also like the maintenance guy for we had like eight uh, different pieces of apparatus and I was the maintenance guy for that. I, I became a training officer. I was training our volunteers, started an academy for them. I was working on grants. I was doing fire prevention stuff. You know, it was just tons and tons of stuff on top of just being a regular firefighter. Um, that's what, that's what you get in those those small towns is you wear exactly all those hats <laughs> yeah and, and and i mean even like some of the bigger ones were you know it's just kind of the way of the fire service now um and there's just you know you're not just putting out fires you're no. doing the ems hazmat rex you know you know the list goes on um but yeah especially true in in the smaller towns and stuff so uh, it was very busy, you know, part of me wonders if I was staying that busy to block out some things or if it was just how I was, I think it's kind of a combination of both, you know, um, yeah. but eventually, uh, after I've been there for a little over a year, I think it was like a year and a half, um, I, I pr promoted to Lieutenant and, uh, had a, a new firefighter with me and we, had a pretty bad wreck and this was where you know things have been pretty good with my post-traumatic stress and then this incident made it come roaring back so we had a wreck involving one of our police officers um where he was uh t-boned on a highway by a garbage truck um and came in actually before our shift started it was like 6 52 i think when it came in uh, but me and my new firefighter were already there, uh, ran the call, uh, discovered what was going on. Uh, he was kind of barely breathing. Um, it, but the ambulance supervisor came on scene with us. We were able to pop the door open, assist them with stabilizing him. But this Mack truck and his uh, vehicle had gotten to where they just became one and his legs were pinned in the dash. Um, and of course they ran off the road in a muddy ditch as well. So the rain and everything, I mean, it was just a horrible mess pretty much. Mm. Um, tried pulling the vehicles apart, but just couldn't, the brakes had locked up on the garbage truck. Um, so just me and one other firefighter and the whole time I thought some more help was on its way, um, because it was the start of the shift. Um, never really showed up, um, at times I wish I had called on the radio for it, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's a scenario I've gone over a lot in my head. Um, you know, and, and in my mind, the chief was going to be showing up, seeing the engine was gone, hearing the radio traffic. Um, and I still don't know why he didn't show up, but he didn't. Um, and I, I won't go into all that. It doesn't necessarily even matter now, but, uh, at the time, I was pretty angry about it. Yeah, I mean, it's super hard to run a call like that. Let's probably, I don't know if you knew him, the officer, but I mean, if he's in oh, a yeah. local jurisdiction, I mean, there's a good chance that you know him. And then you're so focused when you're shorthanded to just get the job done that you assume that the normal things that are happening, you know, the chiefs responding or mutual aid or whatever is happening just isn't happening because you're working as frantically as you can to save this person's life. Exactly. And I mean, I, I beat myself up a lot un, unfairly over that. Um, but yeah, so yeah, we showed up in there. It's, obviously I, I had to take command of that scene and had so much going on that, especially because we're shorthanded anyways, that yeah, you kind of 
assume, especially because we weren't a big department, when you walk in, if none of your crew is there and an engine's gone, I mean, you should probably check on them and see what's going on. Yeah, and yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know <laughs> why he didn't show up. I don't know if I ever will, but, um, but, and yeah, I did know him, uh, the police officer. Um, I actually had, we had a really good relationship with the police officers there. I was working on, uh, trying to develop a, a rescue team with our PD. Um, and, and he was the guy that hung out a lot at the station and he actually reminded me a lot of my squad leader in Iraq too, which probably just helped bring that post-traumatic stress back even more. Yeah. Uh, but you know, we got him stabilized. Um, and eventually someone worked the air brakes down in the garbage truck to where we were able to separate the vehicles. And then I could do a dash lift and get them out. Um, but it took us about an hour. Um, and then, you know, once we loaded him up, wasn't sure if he was going to be alive or dead. And, you know, it's funny when I used to tell this story too, especially when I was still dealing with my trauma, like people thought that he had died in that wreck. And I was like, Oh no, he came back, made a full recovery. And, and whatnot but <laughs> so everyone's like well then like you did good you did your job but i just i constantly had this feeling and some of that was because back at the station i wasn't getting that support i wasn't getting that you did a good job i was feeling very alone at that time yeah. um and you know again like i i unfairly beat myself up over it um especially you know and i just was like man i should have been faster i could have done this but you know the the goal was accomplished. He wasn't hurt further. You know, extrication, the goal is cutting around the patient, not causing further injuries. So um, thankfully, I had I actually hadn't done any like formal vehicle extrication training. I think I missed that day in the academy or something. So I, I had taught myself by watching a whole bunch of stuff on YouTube and then teaching it to our volunteers. Um, okay. And that ended up obviously being another good blessing in disguise because um you know i dove in that's one of the best ways to learn anything anyways is you know by doing it right um, but anyway so things were a after that call happened there was definitely a big change in me i had a lot of stress and then just i mean after that call you know we were still busy through, you know it was the beginning of our shift and then had another busy day and then after that um i was coaching a crossfit class you know but after this call i was i remember like there was some sort of a rowing workout and i just could not function you know things just weren't working right in my head i couldn't focus and i had to have uh one of my good friends that he was a coach as well was there and i was like and he was also in the ems world so he he knew what happened and everything and i was like dude you need to take over for me like i can't i can't coach today so he took over and kind of did whatever I could, I guess, to de-stress and then back to work the next day, you know, and it was just kind of this endless cycle, cycle. that went on for a while um, until th eventually. So there were, there was obviously a lot of problems with that department um, and I won't go into too much of that, um, but I, me and another firefighter filed a complaint against the chief um, and Basically, two days later, we were fired by the city manager. So um, he tried to force a meeting, and it was pretty obvious what he was trying to do. We just asked to reschedule, and he said, if we walk out the door, we're, we're fired. So that was what we did. Um, and then it was this huge like media storm, too, because people had heard about these two firefighters getting fired. And uh, it was just – I remember leaving – and, you know, it was a route I'd driven a billion times to get back to my house, but I was completely lost. I had no idea where I was. Um, and that's where, you know, you could tell I I'd obviously had like a mental break. Um, my son was also, he had just been born like three or four months before all this. So newborn baby on top of all this stress of being wrongfully terminated. And, and I, I was still dealing with issues from that wreck that I'd just never yeah. really gotten over. So, yeah, not a good uh, combination for everything. And um, so, yeah, I was uh, got home. I was, I was dealing with all that wrongful termination, newborn baby. Um, and I tried to just push through it. But there were times that, I, you know, I had to go to the VA for help. And um, 
at least I realize that not a lot of people do that, I guess. Um, yeah. I try to give myself a little bit of credit with just like, hey, I was like, something's wrong. I need to go get help. So I started seeing that counselor again. Um, the same way that I had seen, but now, you know, it'd been a while when I've been working for almost two years. Um, I was doing just that. I was working and coaching, working and coaching, you know, didn't, you know, I was still doing my strength training stuff, but I wasn't doing a whole lot of meditation anymore. And, you know, just a lot of other things to uh, self care, even just, yeah, you know, yeah. taking a day off kind of thing, you know, because right. a lot of times I was off Saturday and Sunday. Well, that's when I was coaching. And then Sunday was like kind of, I either had a strongman class to teach or, or I was doing a workout on my own, which was good, but you know, not resting. Yeah. So, <laughs> Got to rest mentally and fit and physically. I mean, I think you, we tend to get in these cycles of just, right work like you can constantly just work right it's just like I get up i gotta be there to the gym and then i gotta go to work and then i gotta come back and teach and then you're just so good at at that habit right of creating that habit of work and then almost right falls into a trap where it's just right mind numbing well that's what i have to watch now just even just like good habits like sometimes i was like man i think i'm doing too many good habits where it doesn't become a good habit it becomes just added stress you know where it was like all right i'm gonna do my cold plunge in the morning then i'm gonna do some breath training and then i'm gonna do this 10 minute walk and then i'm gonna meditate and it's just it turns into like like how many different things am i gonna do that's supposed to be positive sure and then you know it ends up just having a negative effect in, instead and i i know that now um but yeah so at the time and when I was working, I was trying so hard to make the department better, too. And I was just like, you know, kind of thinking like, oh, I'll just work really hard right now and things will get better. But, you know, um, it you can't do that as one person either. And these sort of things take a lot of time. Um, and that's definitely always been a weakness of mine. I'm not a very patient person, but I've definitely learned over the years now to be a little bit more patient. But, uh, but yeah, so. I had this uh, going on where like, I got home trying to figure out what to do with new baby, um, you know, but, you know, my wife would ask me to like go, you know, get my son like some milk or change diaper or whatever. And I would end up wandering off doing some random sort of thing that something had triggered me into doing whatever and um, wasn't a good uh, situation at all. Um, I eventually... When I went to the VA, I was uh, uh, actually first waiting on my uh, counselor I was seeing, and she was late. I got this email about active shooter training, but in my mind, it went to that there's an active shooter after my family. Mm. And, you know, I thought, you know, they were in danger. So I started like screaming in the middle of the road on the phone with them, telling them to like go to a fire station. My wife's telling me I'm crazy. She's not going to a fire station. And um, and eventually, you know, the, one of the guys that worked at the counselor place came out, um, heard me yelling all the random things in the street and asked me if I was, you know, had an appointment. Was I OK? Like. Then my counselor came pulling up fast and uh, she uh, recommended I go to the VA, uh, went to the VA and. I was able to calm down some, but that was when they first gave me some sort of mild anxiety medication. And I'd never been on medication at all in my life, but um, that was kind of the start of a downward spiral. Um, and I really didn't take it much, but uh, things were just continued to get worse. I eventually got hired fairly quickly by another department, um, but I still had all these stressors going on you know now I, I still had the new baby still had just all the trauma i was dealing with anyways and now i had a wrongful termination lawsuit going on and just everywhere i went is like people were talking to me about it sort of thing and it was uh yeah just just a, a ticking time bomb basically compound effect right you can't you can't escape it it's just compounding wherever yeah. you go whatever you're doing right yeah and, and and I actually, I knew quite a lot of people because of my coaching job. It was right in like uh, downtown Oklahoma City. So I knew a lot of different people and everyone had heard about 
what happened to me and stuff. And um, so, yeah, it was just very tiring. I, I wasn't sleeping pretty much at all. Um, and, you know, sleep deprivation will obviously do a lot anyways to you. But um, I eventually went back to the VA um, after having like another mental break. And then they diagnosed me saying I was bipolar and schizophrenic. Um, and I got like this gallon size Ziploc bag of tons and tons of different medications. Um, and you know, I wasn't bipolar or schizophrenic. Um, we've had a pretty short interaction, but you can probably tell already. I'm a fairly calm, mild mannered person. Yeah. Um, and, but you know, I, I just kind of thought like, well, I guess I'm bipolar now, um, which isn't usually how that works. You know, it's usually a long time period over the years that you can have to assess that but um you know I, I tried it at first you know I had okay I was trying to stay positive I, I had actually switched gyms was working at a different gym new department um and with that though you know there's still even stressors to I had two new jobs now I was working at a new gym learning new names same thing with this new department um, and now I was on this new medication that I'd never been on in my life. And I started to have horrible side effects from it. You know, when you're not psychotic and you put on, get put on psych meds, it tends to make you psychotic. Yeah. So I started having uh, blurred vision. Um, I was so stressed out that I shit myself twice. Um, and then on top of that, uh, yeah. Did I already say blurred vision? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I had the blurred vision, and I was supposed to be a new driver, too. Um, I would get muscle spasms. I mean, it was just, it was bad. And I'd call the VA, and I'd tell them, like, you know, I didn't have all these side effects. And they're like, well, you know, it's just part of the new medication. Just keep on taking them. And, you know, they weren't really listening or paying attention. And um, it eventually got so bad where uh, one of the days I was at work, um, and I still, to this day, like, don't really know what necessarily was real and what wasn't. Um, but I became very panicked that like someone was trying to kill me. Um, you know, and I just was not functional. I still hadn't really slept. They had called me to come back in a little early before my actual shift started. And, you know, again, I still don't know what was going on. Um, I was trying to work still, but just, you know, they could tell something was going on with me. Um, and so I eventually told my captain, like, hey, like, I went to the VA recently. They put me on a bunch of psych meds. It's messing with my brain chemistry. I think I need to go to the hospital. So, you know, they were like, all right, well, that makes a lot of sense because i would you know, been doing all kinds of weird stuff. And uh, so I tried driving to the hospital, but I'd couldn't drive on my own. I kept thinking that someone was trying to kill me. Um, I kept thinking someone was following me. So I pulled over, called 911, and I actually got the department that I had just left because they did their own dispatch too. So they were like, oh, is this Matt? <laughs> and so uh, they came and got me. And honestly, if I wasn't in better shape, I feel like I possibly would have had a heart attack because my blood pressure was like 200 something over like 130 or 140 oh, wow. it was yeah and uh but eventually kind of calmed down uh they actually instead of driving me to the va because it would have been a long drive from where i was at uh my mom came and picked me up um and when she did and her and we were driving back and her car her stereo said no audio because it wasn't connected to bluetooth or something like that but in my mind, I took that as like someone was trying to send me a message telling me no audio, stop talking. So I stopped talking at that point and would only use like hand and arm signals pretty much. Um, I thought everyone, are, are you familiar with brevity codes? I'm not, I'm not. So <clears throat> the easiest way for me to describe them is like, so an example, when we were in the Marines, say we're on a patrol and someone spots an IED Instead of just saying, hey, there's an IED over there, because, you know, there might be some sort of trigger man, you say avalanche or something. Use that instead of like, hey, did you hear about okay. that avalanche? And that would mean IED. <clears throat> so people would be talking in regular conversations, but I'd be thinking, OK, they're meaning <clears throat> some sort of other thing. 
Um, and that was, you know, so the start of the no audio, quit talking, doing these random things in my mind that I think are missions and stuff. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I got home and I basically completely tore apart my parents' closet because I saw something that I thought was telling me to look for something old in there. And I actually found uh, my Glock that uh, the VA had told my dad to take away from me after one of my visits. So then I thought even more that someone was trying to have me do some sort of a mission or something that I just didn't want to do. And uh, But eventually uh, <clears throat> I went to the VA the next day, uh, my dad drove me and, uh, I checked into the psych ward there. Um, they actually thought I had brought a bomb to the VA because I had my gym bag with me and I just sat it down. Cause I heard someone say, drop the bag, like in a conversation, like he dropped the bag or something. And so I dropped my gym bag and wandered off thinking I was like doing who knows what. And yeah, my dad found me before. I went in and he said the police were trying to find me. They thought I brought a bomb to the VA and I just still wasn't talking either. So it doesn't really look very good for me, but um, they eventually got me in uh, to talk to someone. And then that was when they took me up to the psych ward. And um, that was a whole other traumatic experience in itself. Um, you know, they, they were trying to have me committed while I was in there. Um, thankfully, like th there was a, a couple of good nurses there and they talked to my wife and were trying to explain to her, like, she needs to try to get me out of there as fast as possible. Um, cause what they were doing to me in there just wasn't right. Oh. Um, they, they weren't really trying to help me. Um, and just, I mean, just the overall treatment of not just me, but other veterans in there was not what you should see in a VA hospital, but, um, yeah, they wouldn't let me leave. Um, eventually, um, I was able to get out after 10 days, uh, mainly because I, I think I quit taking the meds they were giving me. I was just pretending to take them and flushing them down the toilet. And then I got some of my senses back and was kind of like, not as crazy. <laughs> so, you know, weird how that works, but, um, I was able to get out and by the I, time I, just, I lost my, I oh, lost sorry. my other job. Huh? Go ahead. I, I just can't imagine you doing that and then putting things together, realizing where you're at. Exactly. That yeah. Would be well, and it's, and when I first terrifying. got in there too, like I, I thought that they were going to be like, someone was going to be extracting me or something that I was going to go out a window or someone was getting me, I'd go do this mission and I kept thinking, like, if I do this one thing, that's when they'll they'll get me or something. I thought I had to change my name. So I started, like, to say my name was Noah when I was in there. And, of course, they know I'm not Noah. But, you know, and I, I did some other name while I was in there, too. But, um, yeah, it was just, it was bad. And then, yeah, eventually kind of realizing, like, once I got off the meds of, like, man, how am I in here, you know? And, um, but... But I did get out, and uh, I lost my other job now, which, you know, I, I understood losing that one because I was not ready to get back on the job yet, you know. Yeah. Um, and especially because I'd been gone for uh, 10 days in the hospital. You know, they probably didn't have any idea where I was sort of thing. Or they probably were like, he's probably in the hospital. And But uh, anyways, so I felt extremely hopeless all over again. And uh, thankfully, my family heard of Camp Hope, um, which I don't know if are, are you familiar with it at all or a little bit about it. And I've heard a lot of like it's very popular, right? Um, it's it's gotten way bigger compared to when I was there. Yeah. Like now it's kind of a nationwide thing. It's with the PTSD Foundation of America. Um, they're, they're it's kind of different uh, uh, residences. uh Where's it? Yeah, I said that weird. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded good to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, all over the nation now. But yeah, uh, Camp Hope, when it started, it was just like pretty much a couple houses, um, just kind of ran by veterans that kind of just veterans helping each other out. Um, now, I mean, they got like this huge multi story building. There's like 
probably hundreds of veterans at Camp Pope. It's this whole very well organized uh, thing that it's grown into from just kind of a, a house where, you know, when I got there, I was sleeping on the couch kind of thing. So, but yeah, my family thankfully heard of Camp Hope. I still had no idea what was going on, though. I thought maybe they like we were driving down to Houston from Oklahoma, and I thought maybe they were going to be like sending me to NASA and studying my brain or something. I mean, I was just still not talking. Um, yeah, and uh, when I got to Camp Hope, too, I thought that you know, everyone there, yeah, they're veterans and stuff. But, you know, I told you I, I did some contracting work. Well, I kind of thought, okay, everyone here is a contractor and they're trying to extract me. Okay. Maybe I'm the principal now. Okay. I get it. So I'll, I'll play along or whatever. So, <laughs> um, but they actually lost me when I first checked in because I had wandered off and found this room that was just dark and was just hiding in there. Uh, but eventually the guy that ran the place found me and I was just standing there in the dark and he was just kind of like, what are you doing, man? And I just, wasn't moving at first and then just kind of walked out and eventually went into one of the houses and uh i hid in uh the bathroom because i thought that now i was the principal so that's like the safe room and eventually one of the guys came to the door and their tradition at the time was any new guy they cooked the mistake so he came and he just knocked and he was like hey man like you want to come out and have a steak so kind of lured me out with the uh, food which is a, a good good thing for me. So, uh, came out and, you know, obviously, uh, I, I think part of what makes camp hope work so well is just the fact that, um, you're in a safe environment and there's other veterans there helping each other, you know, like it has this whole program and everything, but I think so much of like the magic of what makes it work is just other veterans and, and there's other first responders there too. Um, and actually when I was first there, um, I, I'd been there for maybe getting close to a month and I almost left because, you know, I, I was like, Hey, I need to talk to a firefighter, you know, like I'm dealing with, like I dealt with my Marine Corps yeah, yeah. trauma stuff in Iraq, Afghanistan. I have something different now that unless you've been a firefighter, you don't really understand, you know, you kind of do, but not, it's, you know, it's not the same. Uh, but thankfully they, uh, found a guy that he was with HFD and he had gone to Camp Hope before me, um, and he came, uh, visited with me. I actually let me like stay in his house for a few days, um, and that was where I really started to heal because I talked to this other firefighter with years on the job, and you know he reassured me that I did the right thing. Um, not only with the wreck, but um, I felt a lot of guilt filing that wrongful termination lawsuit. Yeah or not in the lawsuit, but the uh, um, hostile work environment complaint um, that I filed against the chief because, you know, I felt like I had like stabbed him in the back and that was the way he definitely took it as, but, you know, I, and I told him, you know, it wasn't personal, it was professional, but there was a lot of stuff going on at the time that was not safe and wasn't right. And so, you know, we were just trying to make some changes and it got handled horribly. Um, but, you know, talking with him, you know, talking to your peers was able to, you know, that, that, that's the magic I think of the fire service anyways, when guys are, you know, that morning coffee or sitting around the kitchen table, um, and doesn't even necessarily have to be actually talking about the trauma, but just talking, you know, so community um, back to the community that you're right there they're close to right the people that you work with and spend so much time with you i, I hate to see that tradition ever really you know go. yeah I, I feel like it, it's a bit harder now with uh honestly like the smartphones and everything because yep. now people are able to just go get on their phone and connect with whoever when it used to be you know you were just there and Right. had to find something else to do <laughs> right so, but now yeah uh, and and hopefully uh, you know i feel like it'll always stay alive at least a little bit you know I, I hope at least but but yeah that was again so much of what actually helped me was I, I got to talk to this other firefighter now um try to get my life back in order and and then after i'd been there at, at one point i heard a, a guy tell his story where he talked about just flushing his meds down the toilet and 
he was dealing with more of like an opiate addiction, but still, you know, I, I never like sometimes when I tell my story, people think that maybe I got addicted to the muscle relaxers they gave me or something, but I never even took them. Um, it was just I was told early on too with, with the psych meds of what it does to your brain waves that it's a bad idea to just stop taking it abruptly, that you can have some pretty serious side effects, seizures, you know, who knows what yeah, else. Yeah. So you kind of have to wean yourself off. Um, so when I was at Camp Hope, I basically just started doing that kind of on my own until eventually, um, the lady, she wasn't a nurse. Now they have an actual nurse handling the meds, but the lady at the time was handling the medications was like, you're seem like you're doing a lot better lately. And I was like, yeah, stop taking my meds. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, again, weird, like yeah. someone that's not psychotic, stop taking their psych meds. And, you know, I started talking again and you know, just being more of my normal self. Um, you know, my wife hates to think about that time because she always says my eyes just looked, you know, gone. And, you know, yeah. she didn't think that she was ever going to get her husband back. Um, but, you know, she was a superstar during all of this, staying with me, being supportive, because especially when I was as crazy as I was, there's a lot of women that would have just been like, well, he's gone. Oh, well, you know. True. So. But she she stuck by me, was very supportive. Um, so while I was at Camp Hope, I was able to get off the medications. Um, and we decided that we wanted to stay in the Houston area, just kind of have a new start because I had too many reminders when I'd go back home. Um, so uh, I eventually got a job at uh, another gym um, and started volunteering. Um, so that was huge for me. At first, I was having a pretty difficult time finding a job, which was just, um, you know, it sucked. It kind of made me question my self worth and everything. And um, but eventually, uh, this guy at a uh, it was CrossFit West Houston um, gave me a, a chance. You know, that's what it felt like. And um, I was so glad to get back into the coaching world. And Again, that had always kind of been my therapy. Um, and now I had this new community that was very supportive. Um, and so I was able to start coaching again and then start volunteering again um, and get, you know, get my feet wet a little bit because yeah. my family and, and myself, I was worried that, you know, I'd never go back to the job um, when I was all crazy. Anytime I'd hear like a siren or something, I'd start doing some random thing because i'd get triggered and you know like at one point i thought there was a sniper in my parents attic and i climbed up in there and had all the lights off and everything and climbed all the way up to where i was about to climb outside of like where their chimney is until i kind of came to and realized what i was doing made zero sense um you know so that that was kind of a regular occurrence then um but was able to you know start volunteering um, and start trying to figure out like what I was going to do with my life from there. So um, I was coaching uh, for about a year until I eventually got hired by another department and went full time. Um, and unfortunately then I moved uh, out of Houston and I'm now in uh, orange Texas, which is like Southeast Texas. Um, and yeah, so now uh, back to full time firefighting. I, I've been here since 2016 now, and now I'm a captain. Um, and started doing a uh, personal training on my garage, which I love. I still I still miss coaching at a regular gym sometimes, yeah. but um, I I've always liked the one on one and interactions more. Um, and so I uh, and I, I became a one of power athletes coaches. I'm not sure if you're familiar with power athlete or not. Um, I've seen stuff on your Instagram and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. I, lots of good. I've been following them for like forever. So like, uh, and actually the guy, uh, Rob that owns the CrossFit gym became one first. And that was kind of like my inspiration of like, you know what? I need to go ahead and do this to just get some more knowledge in me. And it's a great network of strength coaches, all kinds of good people. And, uh, uh, just, just a cool thing to be a part of, you know? Um, and, yeah, but that's uh, 
a very condensed version of my story, I guess. Yeah. It's a, it's a long, long journey of uh, ups and downs, right? That's just our lives are full of these journeys that are ups and downs. And I'm, I, I can't imagine, right, going through what you went through like that and your family and your wife, like just the ripple of effect of, of that. And then being able to get to where you are today. I mean, what words would you tell somebody like if they're having any of these thoughts or feelings and stuff like that, what, what words of advice would you give them? Uh, definitely try talking to someone, um, a professional, you know, it takes a good balance. I think, you know, like we we're just talking about like talking with your peers and how much that helps. Um, but I think you still need a good balance of peer and professional support, Yeah, you know, and find someone that you can build a rapport with that you trust um that you're comfortable with talking to um you know it's not something that you have to do for forever but a a good analogy that i've heard from someone is it's kind of like getting the oil changed on your vehicle you know it's just this kind of yearly maintenance that you need to do for yourself too just every now and then uh you know go check in with someone talk um and that's something i discovered um after i been on the job here for a while was around i think around 2020 when i started having recurring nightmares again and it was kind of this like okay what's going on why am i having these again and it was just i guess maybe all the the calls i'd ran recently and then the stress of everything going on then um just made it to where okay i need to check back in with myself Um, but now you know i realized this and I, it was kind of like, okay, hit the brakes on some things, check in with someone, you know, do some maintenance, do some good meditation. You know, yeah. I, I've always done my strength training and I, I credit that a lot with uh, one of the reasons, uh, you know, I, I I never became suicidal. Um, I know that tends to be a big symptom with PTSD. Um, and it always, it tends to always get associated with it too. Um I try to always tell people to, you know, because some people think they have to be suicidal to have PTSD. And it's like, no, you know, that's not the case. You know, no. it, it definitely can get that bad. Sure. Um, but if you do certain things, then hopefully it never does reach that point. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's kind of my advice now for people is like check in with someone, do do some mindfulness training, make sure you're eating the right foods, you know, get some movement in you know, sleep too. I mean, you sleep better, everything's better. <laughs> yeah, like, that's, and that's, that is for sure. And that's a huge problem for us now. And that's, again, kind of what I realized when I did kind of a re-evaluation of myself was I wasn't getting good sleep. Most firefighters don't. Um, no. You're definitely not, even if you're on shift and you might have gotten like eight hours but those eight hours was not good quality sleep you know right right and that's why i I really hammer home when guys are on their days off like do something to get better sleep and it's hard because it's your days off and especially with younger guys you know they want to go party and have fun and it just it eventually catches up with you you know (laughs) it definitely does my my excuse me <clears throat> spade where can people follow you and see what you're doing and you know get some additional inspiration from you uh yeah i guess my instagram is probably the best one it's just spade sc s-p-a-i-d sc um i have like so many different emails now from getting a different phone and stuff it's just yeah i got like five different emails so email is not the best way uh, to get a hold of me, but yeah, um, that or like my Facebook page is Spade Strength and Conditioning, um, or just look me up. However, you know Matt Spade. There's not a whole lot of us out there, and yeah, um, and yeah, just I, I'm usually like I, I, you know I love some of our interactions we've had too. Yeah, um, yeah, you know we're, it's just kind of yeah. I'll, I'm usually very responsive if someone reaches out and uh, has a question or anything. Yeah, I, I think some some people may have some questions that they might want to reach out to you with or maybe filling some things and not quite sure and, and get your opinion on because we all, we all experience the first responder world in a different way and have our 
different triggers and symptoms and different likes and dislikes and everybody's perspective is completely different. So I think they might reach out to you and, you know, with some, maybe some things that they're struggling with. Um, and I really appreciate you being on today and telling your story. Yeah. And with that, I totally forgot to mention the PTSD. Oh, yes. Separate. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm uh, doing a campaign. Yeah. <laughs> the whole reason I reached out to you. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. So I'm doing a campaign. Uh, it's called PTS December. So look that up on Instagram or Facebook. Um, it runs during the month of December. So um, just went well with the name too, for one thing. But um, uh, it was originally, uh, I think you're familiar with Devote December. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's how I originally started following you and listening to stuff or not. I, I honestly don't remember now at this point. But, um, you know, I took that over from Annette Zapp and Chris Morella. Um, kind of made it my own thing now. Um, it's for all first responders, whether you're police, CMS, dispatch, fire. Um, and my goal with it, just like what we were saying earlier, is basically for it to be a more, eventually turn into having a more proactive approach to mental health instead of reactive. You know, we're always, oh, so-and-so ran a bad call. Now let's do all this stuff for them, you know? And, yeah. It could be, a, I get, you know, you're still going to have problems in this job. It's still going to come up. But if you start out with some tools and some good habits, then, you know, my goal is that hopefully it won't get as bad as it did for me. Um, and for many others, there's stuff that's way worse, too. Um, but if we start out, you know, and the whole goal of the PTS December is um that you take action too. So there's the five, five, five that you do every day, which is five minutes of mindfulness training, five minutes of mobility work and a five minute walk. Um, You can combine them all into one 15 minute walking meditation. If you want, you know, kind of hit all, Mm -hmm. all three of them, um, however you want to do it. And and if you want to do it even longer than that, Um, you know, it started out and the way I got this idea too, was for one of the devote December's, I did 15 minutes of silent meditation every day for it. And just the change that I got from that, doing it every day, and then it became back into an everyday habit for me. You know, that's that's kind of my goal with this. It's just real short, real simple, get it done, and then hopefully it will turn into a better habit. And, you know, you'll be more prepared for when, you know, the stressors come up because they're going, you know. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. We'll, we'll make sure we have that in the show notes, the information for that. And uh, people can look to your Instagram page to find out more about that. And then um, I'll also be sharing some of your posts about that during the month and joining in on some of the activities as well in December. Awesome. Cool. Thank well, you. Yeah. Thanks, Faye, for being on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you access your podcast. If you know someone that would be great on the show, please get a hold of our host, Jerry Dean Lund, through the Instagram handles at Jerry Fire and Fuel or at Enduring the Badge Podcast. Also, by visiting the show's website, EnduringTheBadgePodcast.com. For additional methods of contact and up-to-date information regarding the show. Remember, the views and opinions expressed during the show solely represent those of our hosts and the current episode's guests.